frogs that I did uh, my dissertation work on, which is, uh, and I'll show you the phylogeny, and then we'll look at these and try to figure out what would be the best way for us to, um, to, uh, to uh, name these higher level groups. So this is a group of frogs called uh, the family Ceratobatracidae, and this is a group of frogs that occurs in, uh, in the Pacific, in the islands in Southeast Asia, and it's a group of frogs that um, can be found with a big clade in the Philippines. Actually, let me just show you a map first. Okay, so, um, so it's a big group of, of frogs that have a big clade of, a uh, big portion of in the Philippines and another portion in the Southwest Pacific. So I'm gonna walk you down this tree here and just show you how these have been arranged by taxonomists. And I hope you'll understand why, and, but try to pay attention to why that they did what they did. So here's a, clade, a group of frogs. So this is our evolutionary tree. And remember, we start at the tips and work our way back. So these are the, these are the ancestors of these things. There's this big clade or big group here um, and this group is divided into, uh, actually let me scroll up, sorry I'm going to have to go back and forth between the computer. So there's two big clades in this group. There is this group here, and this is a group um, that is distributed in the southwest Pacific on the islands in the Solomon Islands and New Guinea and eastern Indonesia. And then there is this group here, which is a big giant clade of frogs that occur in the Philippines. So there's two big overall clades. And I'm going to focus primarily on this discussion on this clade here which is where it gets really confusing. So this is the, the clade of frogs in the southwestern Pacific, and it's divided into several distinct clades. There's this big group here that all cluster together. Those are all called platymantis, and that's the genus, the genus name for those. Uh, this clade here is called Batrachylodes, and these are, um, so platymantis are frogs that look like this. Batrachylodes are these little, little miniaturized frogs that are about as big as my, the tip of my finger, little tiny things. Um, there's this frog here, Ceratobatrachus, which is this giant frog here that has a point on its snout and big horns on its eyes. So it's considered to be really different. So it was called its own genus, Ceratobatrachus. And then there are these frogs in um, frogs that, uh, and so all the animals that I've talked about so far are water, are frogs that live on the land. Then there's a group of frogs, these giant ones here, that are much more like uh, Goliath frogs here in Cameroon. They're big frogs that live in the water, and they're called discodiles, and they're represented by this group here. So I've showed you a couple different genera, platymantis, discodiles, batrachylodes, and ceratobatrachus. So here's discodiles, that group there. But notice that um, a portion of the things that have been called discodiles come out over here as well. So discodiles is not coming out as a monophyletic group, right? Just like we've been talking about. Discodiles comes out in a couple different places in the tree. One clade there and one clade up here. There's the Ceratobatrachus, the one thing by itself. And then um, here's Batrachylodes. Now most of those all come in a single com clade. And so most of these things have a single common ancestor that's right here. But notice that up here is another species, this thing here. So Batrachylodes and um, Discodiles are both polyphyletic, using the terminology that we've used so far. And then notice, so then we've got Ceratobatrachus, Discodiles, Discodiles, And then remember, this big clade down at the bottom are all these species called Platymantis that I've shown you here. And look in between the other, the, the really distinct frogs, Discodiles and Ceratobatrachus. Here's Discodiles. And lotus, notice in between, what are these frogs called that are the ones that are in between them all? They're all called Platymantis. And see how they're all mixed up together there? See where I'm going with this? So Platymantis is this big, huge clade of frogs that's distributed from the Philippines out into the Southwest Pacific. And nested in the, up in the trees are really different looking things like frogs that have horns above their eyes, and those are called Ceratobatrachus. But their closest ancestors are things that are small and normal looking and are called Platymantis. And then Discodiles, the giant frogs that live in the water and have webbing between their fingers and toes, those come out in multiple places in the tree, and each of those clades, their closest relatives, are these little normal frogs that are called platymantis. So platymantis is a big, huge clade that, with respect to these other genera, is paraphyletic, using the terminology that we talked about earlier. Platymantis is paraphyletic with respect to Discodiles, Ceratobatrachus, and Batrachylodes, those other genera. So, there's a real life example of the things we've been talking about. I'm going to scroll back again a little bit from this figure so you can look at it. And we have these two big clades. And that, so I'm going to ask you, what's the best solution? What's the best solution here? We have um, all these frogs in the Philippines are called platymantis, and they're all normal looking little brown frogs. 
up here in the Solomons in Southwest Pacific, we have a big clade of things that are called platymantis. And then a giant clade up here that is mostly platymantis, but nested within it is Discodiles and Batrachylodes and Ceratobatrachus. So platymantis tracks back to this node here. Most of these frogs are platymantis. Most of these frogs are platymantis. But nested up in the tips are some things that are called other names. So again, platymantis is paraphyletic with respect to these other genera. And so what's the best way to fix that solution or that, that problem? What do you think? Remember we said that all that, that higher level taxa like genera and families should be monophyletic. They should contain, they should all come from a single common ancestor and they should contain descendants, all the descendants that, that, that all the individual taxa that descend from that ancestor. Remember the A and B of our definition? So what would you do? I mean the choices are you could be super con conservative and call everything platymantis and then you have to sink or submerge or invalidate the other genera, the big frogs, Discodiles, the horned frogs, Ceratobatrachus, and the little frogs, Batrachylodes. So you'd have to submerge all those genera and invalidate them and call everything platymantis. That would be one solution. And then you'd have a clade of, what would it be, 120 species, all with the same name. Is that solution? There's no right answer here. This is, this is, this is real life classification taxonomy and this is how it's being fought in the trenches of taxonomy and classification every day. I can tell you there's people in this room that would go one way and there's people in this room that would go the other way. And there's people in this room who would fight bitterly for one solution and then we could go back to Kansas and there I would fight it out with people who would go for the other solution. There really isn't a right answer. So what are the, what are the, the, the pluses and minuses or the, the, the benefits and, and, and disadvantage, disadvantages of these two things? We could be really conservative and call everything platymantis, and then we have to sync those genera and change their names. We change all those names back to platymantis. That would be one solution. And at the other end, the other extreme, zooming in on this clade, well, if we wanted to continue to recognize these really distinct things, like look at Ceratobatrachus, this giant weird frog with horns on its eyes. That thing is really spectacular. It should have its own name. That's an argument people have made. This giant water frog, that thing is really different than the little frogs. We should give it its own name. Here's Batrachylodes. Look how small they are. They're so different. We should re retain those different genera, those names, because they're really distinct, and we want to we wanna recognize that diversity. That's an argument that some people might make. And if they made that argument, you'd have to go back to this clade, and look at it carefully, and say, OK, well, if you want to do that, then we have to figure out which of these Discodiles clades, well, first of all, if we're going to recognize Ceratobatrachus as a distinct genus and Batrachylodes as a dis distinct genus, then all these platymantis stuff in between, they all have to get different ger gener uh, generic names. We have to come up with new gen genuses, new genera for each of these clades in between. And then, to make matters worse, Discodiles comes out here, Discodiles comes out here. We'd have to figure out which one of those is the real Discodiles and then name the other one as a new genus as well. So if we did it this way, if we went the other way to the other extreme, we might have to say, okay, this is the, this is this, the clade of Discodiles that contains the type species, a specifier, uh, the type species and this idea of using a specifier in a phylogeny. Um, we would want to figure out which clades contain the species that was used to name the genus. That would be the type species for the genus Discodiles. And I'm going to tell you that that's Discodiles guppii, because guppii was the species that was used to name the genus Discodiles. That makes this genus up here a new genus, and we have to give it a new name. So we have new name there. Ceratobatrachus keeps its name. Then we have to come up with a new name for this taxon, Platymantis. So now we're up to three genera. Then we have to come up with a new name for this thing. So Discodiles, remember that's the real Discodiles. So this clade and this clade has to come up. Each of those have to come up with new generic names. So we come up with new genus, new genus, that's five, six, right? And then we have to come down here. This one already has a genus, that's seven. This here would have to be named as a separate genus because it's on a branch. This, these two could be named as a genus together. So now we're up to a nine. Batrachylodes, that has to come up with, we could probably give a name for this whole clade and sync that name, Batrachylodes. So now we're up to 10. Then there's real Batrachylodes there, 11. So, and then you'd have to go down to the stuff in the Pacific, 12. And then the Philippines, 13. So at least we'd have to come up with 13 generic names. And probably more if you wanted to break up the Philippine clades as well. So what's the best solution? 13 names and a bunch of changes. 
or one genus and a bunch of changes? Because either way, we'd have to make a bunch of changes to the species level taxonomy. Do you understand why? Do you get that? It's a little confusing, but like now we have, look at this, we have Discodeles and Ceratobotrachus and Discodeles and Pulmatorapia and Vitracolodes. If we change all of those to Platymantis, then we have to go back and make a new change to the genus species couplet, the, the joining of the name genus and species. So this has to become Platymantis trosulus and Platymantis vert vertebralis and Platymantis wolfi. And so all those non-Platymantis things all have to be put back in Platymantis, and now we have to make a change between the genus and the species couplet. And remember from our lectures earlier, we want to go with a conservative, stable, and non-confusing higher level classification system. So what's a way that we could distinguish between these two possibilities? Does anyone have any ideas? There, again, there's no right answer to this, this question. Either we'd have to figure out how many changes we were going to make if we went the conservative way, or how many changes we might have to make if we went the really uh, liberal way. We named 13 genera versus one genus. How would you make that decision? Describe What's that? Describe. describe. Like, uh, uh, Caleb wants to describe all. Caleb wants to describe them all as separate genes. Right. I mean, that's, that's the preference of a lot of people, would be to name them as separate genera. And, um, and there's nothing essentially wrong with that. Um, but the one, one challenge might be that this group has all been called Batracolodes because they're all small little frogs that, um, that do the same thing. And this has been called Discodeles because they're water frogs that, live, that are big and live in, in, in water. They're distinctive. But then in between are all this stuff that's called Platymantis which means, what that means is that taxonomists in the past haven't noticed any differences between them. So one challenge you'd have if you named them all as separate genera would be that for this clade, you wouldn't have any characters. You wouldn't have any synapomorphies, shared, derived characters that you could infer evolved on this branch to link those together and point to that as a monophyletic group because they just look like normal brown frogs and so people have called them all platymantis. Maybe another way of rephrasing that is just that you'd have a hard time diagnosing the genus. Right, you'd have right. a hard time. You'd be able to give this criterion is, is diff, you know, that's how you tell this genus apart from this one, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, there's no right answer, but if you did it, if you went to naming them all a separate genera, you'd have a bunch of things in there, the ones that are now called platymantis, that would be very difficult to diagnose. They wouldn't have any character support. They wouldn't have any higher level diagnostic shared derived characters that we would call synapomorphies. So um, that's a big challenge. Um, and so there's no really right answer with how, to, how you go about doing this. But, um, but um, I picked one extreme. And uh, the paper will come out in a couple months. And, and if you don't agree with me, you're welcome to write a response paper. And we'll, <laughs> we'll have it out in print. <laughs> you might just highlight to the um so Rafe was mentioning what Eric this morning was calling um, the principle of coordination, mm -hmm. right? And so that's when he was talking about the real, the real discodeles, right? Is because the you know when you whoever described the genus that the species with it, you know, is essentially the same authority, right? So that's really what we take as the reference point for determining when you have platymantis or discodeles in so many different parts of the tree. One of those, in theory, is, quote, the real one. But the real is based on taxon authority, not based on your personal opinion of mm -hmm. which one you think best represents, right? right? Your opinion doesn't matter in this case. What matters is, you know, the authority. Yeah. Right. Yep, exactly. A lot of people will try and do it based on their personal preference of what they think is the best one somehow. Right. A, a lot of people will make those decisions based on personal preference, which means that they're arbitrary with respect to the actual rules of the code. They don't really make a, a cogent argument with respect to the principles that we learned about this morning. Some people make the argument that this is really different. Look at that thing. It has horns above the eyes and a big point on its nose. These things are so different, they can't be named the same, the same as this little brown normal frog. You know, they're really different. That's an, that's an argument that doesn't really impress people who use phylogenies to, um, to understand classification. That's, a, an, that's, an audit, that's, that's an apomorphy based argument, that these things are really distinct and different, so we should call them separate stuff. That argument you know, just doesn't really, it's not part of the code, and it doesn't really convince a lot of people who want to look at trees and figure out what are the closest relationships and focus on synapomorphies. Um, what else did I want to say? 
another argument that might, you might hear in this, in this part of the world, well, you hear it all over, is um, that these frogs um, are really distinct and it's an advantage for conservation if we call them separate things. Because if we call them different genera, people will recognize them as distinct and that would be recognized as a Cameroonian endemic or in this case, Solomon Island endemic genus. And that gets you more, more fuel for conservation when it comes to arguing with administrators and government officials. That may be true, but that is, again, not uh, a principle that we learned about that's specific to the code, and it's agnostic with respect to the rules of zoological nomenclature that we learned about earlier. That may be true, but again, that's an opinion base. That's us. That's our current politics and our, our current opinions. That doesn't have anything to do with evolutionary history in the group or the rules of the zoological no code of nomenclature.